really stepping into some encounters and including uh, what the Lord did uh, for me yesterday uh, and helping us speak to some men uh, at a men's breakfast. Uh, we had a time uh, sharing with those men and strengthening the brethren. It's what Jesus told Peter that even when he fell away, that he would be, uh, that he would turn back, and we see that he did because Jesus encounters him and forgives him, and he's the one that speaks with the rest of the disciples on the day of Pentecost. But the assignment that Jesus had given him was that when he turned back to strengthen the brethren. I believe one of the main purposes for us gathering together as a corporate body is to strengthen the brethren. I have already received strength this morning. From the coffee bar out back uh, to the worship and the prayer downstairs and what Lisa was sharing, I have been strengthened this morning. I believe what I'm about to share with you will encourage you and strengthen you this morning. So would you confess by faith and believe and say with me, I will be strengthened in the inner man today for God's glory and my story. Amen. We're starting a series entitled Differently, and we're going to look at seeing things differently this morning. Um, over the past 10 to 12 years, the Holy Spirit has begun to open my spiritual eyes to see things from a different perspective, His perspective. I'm not saying that I didn't in the past, but it, my eyes were opened in such a way through this revelation that in this encounter and in this endeavor, I have been able to uh, walk in freedom and I believe strengthen the brethren and help relieve and release people from fear anxiety and worry so that they can see things differently, they can think differently, they can begin to speak differently, and ultimately, please hear me, behave differently. Amen, it is Jesus. But Christianity has yet to escape the misconception that we, what we do in this temporal world will cause a divine response from another world. We have to escape that concept because what it has led to is an abundance of legalism. If, you, if we as Christians believe that what we do, then re, it, it evokes a change of God's mind for Him to do something from that other world here, that's a misconception. And what it will lead you to is bondage and legalism because you will believe that you manufacture the outcome when in reality the outcome is manifested, not manufactured. Write that down and meditate on that. What is the difference this week as the Holy Spirit shows you that the outcast, the outcast, the outcome is manifest, not manufactured. And if you still have a concept that you are evoking a response of divine from another world because of what you do, then you're going to stay in bondage and works. We see what we expect to see, and then we filter the rest out. Um, let me say it another way. Usually, I hear what I want to hear from Lisa, and I filter the rest out. And she can say a big amen to that. But it's truth that we see what we are focused on and what we want to see, and then we filter everything else around us out. The absolute allegiance to the doctrine of our fathers and the application of those doctrines has been at best limited and at worst faulty. And an overreach because it's put legalism on us and it the better approach for humanity moving forward is for us to, to let competition give way to cooperation see because in legalism that I'm in competition with Pam because if I do more I get more you know what I'm talking about have you ever lived in that mindset 
and that concept that concept that causes you to work and work and work. And if you do this, you'll get that. But we must embrace any need to abandon religious ideologies that taught us concepts that we are separated from God. How many of you have ever heard teaching and doctrine that told you if you did certain things or if you didn't do certain things, that then His presence was taken away from you and there was a distance and separation between you and God. I was taught that. Can I just call it what it is? A lie. Can, have you ever read Romans the 8th chapter? What can separate me? Not demons, not angels, not principalities, not man, not my decisions, not my con conduct. Nothing can separate me. The kingdom of God is an open door to endless possibilities of living a better life than you could have ever understood. I mean, the kingdom of God is the best life on the planet. Amen. Philippians, the third chapter, verse 20, says that our citizenship is referenced, listen, in our joint position, look at the screen, with Christ in heavenly places. Our joint position, our oneness, our, the mystical union, that exists between Christ and the church. We're in Him, seated in heavenly places. Oh, now watch out. What, look what it says. Heaven isn't our goal. Get, look at me. And I mean this with all sincerity and not a joke. If heaven is your goal, won't you ask God to kill you? I, said, I know I said kill wrong. If that's the goal. But it is really our starting point. Because the Savior is our source. And our understanding is sourced in Him, so we must fully embrace our oneness with Christ. It makes a difference because we participate with Christ in causing specific outcomes to manifest. In a closed mind, science suggests determinism that leaves us passively waiting to see something happen. What will happen next? My actions, my thoughts will determine a response from heaven and I'm just hoping for the best. In the kingdom though, we're taught that we tremendously influence the outcomes that we're going to experience. How? Co-laborers with God. In this kingdom, where all things are possible, you can participate in shaping the reality that you are going to experience. Now see, you have to listen and tune into this because I'm not saying that my, I'm doing this by my own power. I'm saying as I co-labor with Christ, you're going to see this come into reality and fulfillment as you hear the rest of this message. You can participate in shaping the reality that manifests in your life. It's a significant key. A significant key is how you look at life. I talk to people all the time, all day, everywhere, that have a mindset and an outlook that is negative. Hell, we're going to hell in a handbasket. America's about to crumble. Economy's bad. Health is bad. Israel's going to uh, have to start World War III. I mean, it's just negative, and it's just always doom and gloom and agony and despair, and if it wasn't for bad luck, they wouldn't have any luck at all, if you're a Hee Haw fan. But when you choose to see differently, things begin to manifest and happen. What do you see? What, what have you put your focus on? We're talking about seeing differently. The simple act of observation influences outcome. There are scientific experiments that have been done over the last 100 years that prove that what you see, what you expect to see, is what the outcome is going to be. Now, I'm not saying that you have control over it. I'm saying you have influence over it as you cooperate with Jesus. Does that make sense? Let me give you an example. Genesis, the 13th chapter, verse 15. 
God is speaking to Abram. He's made a covenant with him. Chapter 12, he tells him to go and do something. And it says there in chapter 12 that it was counted unto Abram as righteousness because he believed. And that from that chapter into 13, it says in verse 15 that God spoke to Abram and said, I will give you everything that you see. That, that's significant. That's important. He didn't say he'd give him everything that he wanted. He said, I'll give you everything that you see. So if you can see it, it's yours. And God said that he's the one that's going to give it to you. So if you are cooperating with him, and you can look as far as your eye can see, guess what? Child of God, it's yours. That will excite me and encourage me, and I'll believe it for myself and my family if you don't want it. <laughs> but that outdated old covenant religion of the past said that our lives are based on certain things leading to other things, cause and effect. If that, then this. If you do this, you read this, you pray here, you give this percentage, or you don't, then these things from God will manifest in your life. And that brings us back to the concept and puts us in an abundance of legalism that what we do then respond, give, requires a divine response, and that's not how it works. The new covenant, somebody say new covenant, of grace, all right, has made those old rules obsolete and replaced them with a system of life that places Christ at front and center, not our conduct. And as long as we want to put our conduct front and center, then we put Christ in the background, and then we are working our fingers to the bone. We get exhausted and frustrated. It brings us to a place of wanting to quit because guess what? We can't do it. And then we will have a revelation of putting Christ in the forefront. This is probably one of the favorite things that I'm going to say this morning. If you look at the screen, it's not our spiritual fight, but our spiritual focus that brings real lasting results. But we have worked so hard and been placed under the bondage of warfare for so long that it's our spiritual fight that's going to bring things to manifest that are real and lasting. When in fact, it's really our spiritual focus. Now, I'm not taking spiritual warfare from you if you want to fight. But I have an enemy that's already been defeated that I don't have to fight. Now listen, when things manifest from other people's lives and in other people's lives that have demonic activity attached to them, I'm not scared. And I'm not going to fight with it. I'm going to rebuke it. I'm going to resist it. I'm not going to give any place or opportunity to it. It has to flee. And I just simply remind it, you've been defeated. That's it. I don't have to fight with you. I, I, the Lord already won the battle. Now, if you want to focus on those things, guess what's going to manifest? What you focus on. Where you put your attention. Where are you looking? Hebrews 12.2 reminds us that we look away from the natural realm and we focus our attention. And Man, there is something to be said about expectation. If you come to church not expecting to get anything, guess what you're going to leave with? If you're in encounter with Christ and you're not expecting the miraculous to, to take place, then guess what? The miraculous is not going to take place because you're not expect you're not giving attention to it. Our expectation and our attention is on Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's expectation and perfection. The word look here is the Aramaic word chore. It means to gaze upon Jesus with full expectation that he is enough. I stuttered a little bit, so I'm going to repeat it. 
It means that when we look unto Jesus, when Paul tells us in Hebrews 12, he says, look unto Jesus. He's saying, gaze upon Jesus with full, uh, full of expectation that he is enough. You don't have to look anyplace else for your source. Your greatest breakthrough may come by learning to see everything inside the life of Christ in you. That could be your greatest breakthrough. Maybe the most critical change that we need to make in our life isn't our situation, but our sight. Maybe your situation won't change, but maybe how you see it does. And if you see it from his perspective, it could bring so much freedom. There's nothing you can imagine that isn't possible when you act in cooperation with Christ. How many things are possible? All things are possible. There's nothing that you can imagine. Our imagination is a powerful thing. It's where we picture things. It's where we get a mental image of what we want to transpire in cooperation with Christ. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, says, See yourselves co-raised. So get in your imagination, get a mental picture that you have been resurrected with Christ. Now ponder with persuasion the consequences of your co-inclusion in Him. What am I saying? You're cooperating with Him, you're co-laborers with Him, you're seated in Him in heavenly places, you're one with Him. There's nothing that can separate you from Him. And so with persuasion, the consequences are nothing short of miraculous. Now, relocate yourself mentally. I believe that if you can relocate yourself mentally, because uh, I've talked to some this week that they've got themselves over here defeated, sick, bound, swirling around, You've got to relocate yourself mentally. Get this picture of what Jesus has done with you. He has raised you. When he died, you died. That old man died and that old mindset died and you were resurrected with him. Now can you just be persuaded that the consequences of your inclusion with him are nothing short of the miraculous? Anything's possible. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities. I love that from the Mirror Bible. Where you are co-seated with Christ in the executive authority of God's right hand. Becoming affectionately acquainted with throne room thoughts will keep you from being distracted again by the earthly realm where you focused intention can be affected by the outcome simply by choosing where you have placed your focus. In other words, if you're focusing on this, the outcome is going to be where you were focused. But if you will become affectionately acquainted with throne room realities and place your thoughts there, now this is building to the climax of what I'm going to tell you is a key in seeing things differently. But you will steer towards what you stare at. Where your attention is will be where the intention goes. We must have focused attention. Your mind, your spiritual vision, your imagination is focused on the outcome. Then we are bringing it, now watch this, here it is, this is important. We are bringing it out of the heavenly kingdom invisible realm into the temporal world. This is the definition of manifest. To see that which is in the invisible kingdom realm, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, to see that invisible realm of the kingdom of God where there's no sickness, no death, no disease, no lack, and then pull that what we've seen in the invisible realm into this temporal realm because Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, that which is visible is temporal, but that which is invisible, unseen, is eternal. 
So we're reaching into the, we're picturing the eternal realm in our minds, and then that is manifested in the physical realm. You have the power, it's really the word authority, to move heaven into earth. So let's go back to the origin of all things. Genesis. And you will find God bringing everything into existence by His intention, then expressed through spoken word. The Scripture says, before the foundations of the world. Does it not? It says, you were found in Christ before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm giving you a template. Okay. I'm giving you a template right now that if you will do as God did, He saw you and me in Christ before He ever spoke the worlds into existence. So He saw it before He spoke it. And He saw differently. He saw it in Christ. You have the power and the authority to move heaven, the kingdom realm, into the earth. He saw the world, then he spoke the world into physical existence. That is our template. Things come from thoughts. Items and incidences come from our intentions. What you are focused on and giving intention to. So reframe it. See it differently. See it through the lens of Christ in you where grace is home base. Learning to see things differently is to accept mystery without insisting on understanding it. If you insist on understanding it, you'll never see things differently. You're going to, if you have to understand it to see it, then you won't be able to reach into in your imagination and see the invisible and pull it in to the physical realm. See, sickness is a this world problem. Why do you put up with it? Because in your imagination, in your mind, if you can see into the invisible realm of the kingdom, there is no sickness. And if you can focus your attention on that and call that into the physical realm, you'll walk in health. Pick your poison. Whatever it is, lack. There's no lack in the kingdom of heaven. But if you can't see that in your mind's eye, in your spiritual vision, seeing things differently, you'll continue to walk in lack. And I'm, don't go out of here saying that I told you that everyone's going to be a millionaire. Because 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us, Paul says, reminds us, if you don't work, you don't eat. But envision yourself with things that you can do, creative ideas, entrepreneurial ideas, investments that you can make. See that in the spirit realm and then call that into the physical realm. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's seeing things differently. Be it unto you, Matthew 9, 29 through 31, be it unto you according to your faith. Blind man shows up. Jesus says, do you want to be healed? He said, yes. He says, be it unto you according to how you see it. Look at, go to the next screen. I want to show you the JRW3 version. Go back one. Go forward one. Outcome will manifest according to how you see it in your imagination. That's my version of be it unto you according to your faith. The outcome that you desire will manifest according to how you've seen it in your imagination. I'm not talking new age stuff. I'm talking about your spiritual vision. I'm talking about how the scripture really is written in the language that it is written in to give us confidence that we can walk in these things. How do you think it's going to be? 
How do you see it? Or how do you imagine it? What is your mental picture of it? Well, that's how it's going to be. Seeing differently is a key to kingdom life because our mental perceptions and expectations shape our reality. Start seeing your life take shape according to the intentional plan based in Christ, not the incidental progression based upon chance. Our life is not by chance. It's not just in case Sarah, Sarah. There is an intentional plan that God has for us. If we can see that and tap into that, we can begin to live out of that and pull that into the realm that we're living in. Perhaps a lot of the things that we have tried have not been successful in the past. And it's time to grow. Anybody want to grow? If you're open to these ideas that you haven't previously embraced, maybe we can begin to grow. Be willing to adapt to new understandings is a vital way that we can develop personally. We cannot move forward and stay where we are simultaneously. And until we begin to see beyond what we see right now, we'll stay where we are. Mentally, spiritually, physically, financially. Paul warned the Galatians that they no longer had the crucified Christ in clear focus. Who bewitched you to go back to seeing things the way that you used to see them? What if our interpretation of life was based on educational, cultural, religious, philosophical, or other sources that have informed our viewpoints and have led us to an incomplete or even a wrong understanding of the best way to live life. If we've allowed those things to influence us and we're not living the best life, this is, this is my declaration. You can choose to make it yours if you want. But I recant and I repent and I set aside faulty views that came from my family, from my faith, from my education and my culture. Now, it may destroy your reputation. Paul said, I haven't apprehended yet. But one thing I do, I'm forgetting those old ways. Jennifer, if you come. Those old mindsets. And I'm striving, I'm stressing, straining towards the prize that God has called me heavenward in Christ. Nothing influences what we experience in life more than where we have set our attention and our affection. I know what you love because I hear you talk about it. I know where you've placed your attention and you would mine as well because I hear you, you hear me talk about it. We must see differently by taking our focus off of, off of the superficial and placing it on the supernatural. Look beyond the circumstances and see Christ. See things from His perspective. Here's something important. I want to leave you with this. We are not bringing something into reality from nothing. I'm not to telling you that you're creating things out of nothing and you're bringing them into a reality. That's not what I'm talking about here. We are bringing it out of the kingdom realm into our world. That's what's called heaven on earth. Matthew 16, 19, I have given you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Keys. Keys are symbolic of authority and ruling power. We rule and reign with Christ in this life through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. So we have keys of authority. So what we're really saying is we are only going to permit on earth what has already been permitted in heaven. It's a key. It's a key for us to see what has been permitted in heaven and not been permitted in heaven and to call that into reality in our world. So I'm not calling 
something into reality out of nothing. I'm calling what He's already created and done for me in the heavenly realms where I'm seated with Him, where I have throne room realities because I'm seated with Him in heavenly places, and I call that into the earth. In other words, we must see it in the invisible for it to manifest in the visible. Just go ahead and stand with me. I, I know that some that may seem deep to some of you. But I think for others it brings clarity to what sometimes we speak words, uh, kingdom language and vocabulary that doesn't make sense to people. So I'm trying to make sense out of some things that we say that we see. I hope you're encouraged by it. I hope you're strengthened by it. I hope you believe it's a reality, and I, I believe that is this is exercising our righteousness. So when we leave today, and we're strengthened in the inner man, and we begin to have a revelation, then we can begin to call things. We use our keys of the kingdom, and we begin to say, "Well, that's permitted in heaven. I, I think I'll go ahead and permit that here." If that's a reality of the throne room, I want that reality in my life. I believe sickness will begin to flee. I believe that disease will know that it's already been defeated. Yeah. I just saw in my spirit, I just saw a huge key being placed in a vault and that vault being opened where there was hundreds of thousands of dollars of cash I mean I just tell you what I'm seeing anybody want that <laughs> because see the riches of heaven are inexhaustible so I see the vault in heaven being opened up and see what when he's doing that for you then he's going to open you up as a window in heaven to pour out a blessing it's not just a window opened in heaven. You are the window that he's opening to pour out. Mm. I'll just lift your hands and thank him. Some of you may need to close your eyes to imagine, and that's okay. Some of you can imagine with your eyes wide open, but would you just use your imagination? And would you see differently today the greatest need that you have in your life? And would you just begin to see if it's physical, if it's financial, if it's relational, what is your greatest need, your greatest desire right now? Don't picture it in the earthly realm. Picture it in the invisible realm of the kingdom. Now begin to keep that picture in your mind and speak it into reality. Father, we thank you that we have the mind of Christ, but not only the mind of Christ, we have the imagination of Christ. We have the vision of Christ. We are co-seated with Him. He is in us. We are in Him. And we're giving competition. We're letting it give way to cooperation. As we cooperate with you, God, in this heavenly realm, things are beginning to manifest. We see the goodness of God overtaking each one right now. We see the riches of heaven unlocked for all of your children. In Jesus' name, we see sickness and disease that does not exist in heavenly realms. We call that into manifestation in the lives of your children today because healing is the children's bread. Thank you, Father. And now we give our attention, we give our affection to you and on you in Jesus' name. Wow. I felt I had to.